All right, all right. Thank you for joining me back for part three. You know, I found these pictures in my my toolbox here, tool shelf I have next to my workbench. And I thought I'd film a quick little, you know, um, quick little just have fun, chuckle, yeah. Uh, 10 minute video about some cool Santa Fe stuff I took pictures of when I was a young man and uh, like everything else but everything else in this incredible hobby it, it just exploded into something else so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and continue where we finished off at at part two uh, that music was by ZZ Top uh, ZZ Top apparently is a huge Santa Fe fan probably Probably model railroaders just like us. And uh, <laughs> that just proves my point. Like I've always said, God loves ZZ Top, the Santa Fe, and New York Yankees baseball. But not current Yankees. They, they're actually kind of disgusting. So I took these pictures, I want to say, in the early 2000s. I knew they were going to be um, scrapped and demolished. And wiped out the face of the earth. What you're looking at. These particular pictures here were not. Incidentally before I go on. Uh, most of the pictures. All of the pictures you saw. Of the Fullerton Depot area. In Fullerton. Downtown Fullerton. Were taken by me. Back in the early. I'm sorry. Back in the late 1980s. Some in the early 1990s. And a couple from mid 1990s. Um, the other pictures you saw. Or. Some of the other pictures you saw, there used to be a train swap meet out here every March and every October at the Paris Trolley Museum. And it's just all things railroading from models to books to tools to lanterns to photographs. And there used to be some gentlemen that used to set up always busy, never even had busy time to talk. That's how busy they were. And they would stick a shoebox under their table, literally, and it was still photographs of railroad related stuff from Southern California throughout the years. And some of these pictures came from them. That one right there. And some other ones I showed in part one and part two. Um, I never got their name. We started to speak more than once throughout the years, but they would always get mobbed at their table. They did an uh, incredible amount of business selling books and stuff like that. And, uh, but to those gentlemen, and if they're watching this, they know who they are. They used to sell at the Paris Trolley Museum every March and October. And they'd always make it a point to stick a shoebox of photographs underneath the table. And you'd buy them for about, you know, like a buck. So I got a bunch of them, some stories to go along with them. There's a name there. So I'd like to give credit to those gentlemen and to this gentleman here. Uh, for for the use uh, of, of their photographs, of their work that I acquired also throughout the years. But let's get back to this guy here. Up in Redlands, California, I used to go visit my best friend out in Beaumont, California. He had a machine shop. He was a big model railroader. And we'd go watch trains running up and down Beaumont Hill every Saturday or every holiday or every vacation day I had. For years and years and years and years and years. God, I want to say close to 20 years. And he became a huge friend. Actually, more like family, like a brother. We had a falling out here towards the end. I haven't seen or spoken to him since. Um, but um, on his way up to his place, I used to pass by these guys here in Redlands, California, along the 10 freeway, the 10 interstate. And along... The 10 Interstate in this part of Redlands here, they still had a working wigwag signal, which eventually got damaged and someone went in and stole the damaged parts. And uh, these things here, uh, and this is all orange groves. Even when I took these pictures here, there were still strips of orange groves amongst the brand new housing tracks that were going up. With these things here, these were oil tanks that the Southern Pacific would fill and refill throughout the seasons, the growing seasons. And the oil from these oil tanks was used for the smudge pots in all the orange groves to that part of the Inland Empire. 
And if you're familiar with that is during the winter, like especially right now, your orange groves will freeze if you have a, a overnight temperatures that dip below a certain uh, low and all your orange, your citrus plants would get destroyed, your crops and stuff, get frostbit. So they set up smudge pots. They set up big fans. So the smudge pots would heat up. Heat rises. The big fans would blow the heat throughout the crops, throughout the acreage, hopefully, covering uh, the crops so your citrus plants, your crops of citrus doesn't freeze and you don't, you know, lose all that money. In order to feed those smudge pots, the railroad had to bring in oil. This goes back to the teens and 20s, guys, if not even before that, the late 1880s and 1890s. And I knew the time for these big giant oil tanks was coming to a near, and sure enough, uh, they're gone. They've been gone for a while. Just things that were here and we took for granted and are gone forever and ever. Now, these are my photographs. And anyone's welcome to use them. You don't have to ask for my permission. Just go ahead and use them to your heart's content. Throw me a bone. Mention my name um, and my YouTube channel. So hopefully you get some new subscribers and viewers heading over my way. And I have one more view. This is a good view because on this view here, the interstate is right here out of, out of the frame of the picture. The Southern Pacific track that ran along the interstate and fed these oil tanks and picked up citrus along the way from all the packing houses is still here. You can see it and the tracks are still there to this day. But the orange girls that are right here and these tanks are long gone. This is all brand new housing or tilt up new construction, industrial parks type thing. And I don't know what's sitting here. And the working with wag signal was pretty much kind of like over here somewhere. Incidentally, out here in Anaheim, California, we still have probably one of the last, if not the last remaining working wigwag signal. It's an ex-Southern Pacific wigwag signal now owned by the Union Pacific. It's about a, a mile away from my house here. It's on its last legs. Why if someone has not rescued it, I have no idea. But uh, one of these days, maybe next weekend, we'll take a trip out there. It's just a mile away from my house. It's just down the street. This is all residential, so it's in a residential area. We'll head down there. We'll shoot videos of that sucker. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to catch a train. It's just a local that works usually during the week, uh, if that. But we'll be out there, and we'll catch pictures of it. And I have been out there when a train passes by, and it starts working, and it just goes tick, whang. You hear the mortar like whirling, like the gears are really worn out. Zzz, donk, tick, donk. So, but uh, she's a beauty. She's uh, a sweetheart, and uh, she's still there with doing her job. After all the wigwag signals in Southern California and California have been wiped off the place of the, the face of the earth, she's still there doing her duty. I think. Hopefully, she hasn't been replaced okay so you saw a picture uh, this is typical of uh, back in the day and even today the Santa Fe local freight haulers would always have two locomotives these are converted uh, Jeep nines where they cut the high nose off and put standard cabs on them and they will run them in uh, tail to tail configuration that way they can go forward and backward and still have a, a cab on either end because it would be impossible to turn the locomotives around pretty much anywhere along the system and um, especially in the branch lines so this is common this is still going on in Fullerton and other parts in Anaheim uh, where I mentioned the wigwags this particular freight car I have here this is also my photograph here. This photograph was taken in Beaumont, California. 
about almost 20 years ago, and I stopped. We were in the car, me, Jerry, Al Espinoza, and Roger Jenkins. We were all in the car. Uh, we'd eat breakfast at Denny's every Saturday morning and just go run up and down the line and check out everything railroad. This is just after the merger when Union Pacific took over the entire Southern Pacific, including the Tehachapi, the Beaumont line. And that's why you see Union Pacific cars on the Southern Pacific line in downtown Beaumont. Uh, the 10 freeway is right behind the cars. You can't see them. They're covered by the trees. Denny's restaurant would be off here on the off ramp. Uh, we're facing north. Reason I stopped the car and took a whole bunch of pictures of this freight car here, this this uh, maintenance away car from the Union Pacific, is because we actually built this car in old scale out of brass, and I went ahead and modified it even more to match this car exactly. We'll talk about prototype modeling. So I actually won a contest. I have it here somewhere in the back, and one of these days I'll shoot a video just about that. But that's a photograph there taken almost twenty years ago, about eighteen years ago. Of, um, of some interesting equipment at the top of the hill in Beaumont. Those of you guys who like steam era water towers, in particular, Southern Pacific steam era water towers, that's what you got right there in the distance. That's also in, um, that's also in Central California, We're running up the uh, I think that's a 99 corridor, corridor, and I think this is a uh, Exeter, if I'm not correct, Exeter on your railroad maps. This is the Southern Pacific, North and South line that runs or cuts through the middle of California through all that agriculture. Think about it. At one time, this was all tracks, and it was all full of uh, ice bunker reefer cars and stuff. Tracks are all gone other than what you see right there, and you got minimal freight traffic. But um, the steam era water tank still stands because this is where all the big Southern Pacific steam, we're talking cab forwards, the daylights, the, uh, the mountains, the 2102s or 2104s, the 5000s, the, you name it. They all went through here. They all stopped and watered. That's a steam era Harriman Southern Pacific water tank. Some more to share with you. Here's something in the neck of my woods. I work in downtown Long Beach. And right where the Union Pacific line ends, this is facing north and south. We're actually facing north. Uh, the line literally ends right where my back is, or the photographer's back. This is not my photograph. And uh, the end of the line of the Union Pacific. And it's still configured that way, but you won't find any more cabooses on that line. The only reason they had a caboose, I think this is a C... CA-11 or CA-12 is because um, this is a branch line, so the locals would use it for their switching moves and stuff. Not my photograph, but this would be the Wilmington Turn. Uh, once again, I work in downtown Long Beach, so this is right there. This is where I go rail fanning on my lunch break. Uh, Wilmington Turn, uh, pretty much this is the harbor, the docks. The container yards or intermodal yards where all the big container ships come in from overseas and either get uh, unloaded or loaded. And we also have a lot of petroleum products, oil, coal, uh, you name it, uh, refineries. It's literally the industrial muscle of the West Coast and a great place to go rail fanning, though you probably won't see this set up anymore. Once again, this is that car I modeled in um, downtown Beaumont. Just another view. Now, those of you in Southern California who are familiar with the 15 freeway, runs north and south, or 215, I'm sorry. No, it's a 15. Anyways, the 15 or 215, however, it's been reconfigured. The one that runs along March Air Force Base and heads down to Paris. This is how I used to look once upon a time. I was told 
This is closer to Riverside at Alessandro. Uh, all this is now covered with modern tilt-up industrial park buildings, big giant warehouses and stuff. All modern, nothing old whatsoever. And um, uh, I was told that the freeway that we travel up and down, which is right here, that travels north and south, was at one time uh, a blacktop, kind of like a highway, a separated highway, which you find in other parts of the country. And uh, I, those of us who grew up in Southern California are used to freeway, so we do not know what he's talking about or what the photographer was telling me when I bought this photograph. But there you can see it off to the side. Two lanes going that way, two lanes going this way, separated by a large grass medium, no fence whatsoever. And there's your oil, there's your tanker cars dropping off or picking up their petroleum or whatever type liquid product. It's a foggy day along the 15 freeway. Riverside is over here to your right, where I was born. And March Air Force Base is over here to your left. March Air Force Base is still used today. Uh, mainly it's, uh, well, I don't want to give anything away to what's going on in the world right now. With China wanting to jump into the fray with Ukraine and... Uh, Sending their balloons all over the place. Just, just say, uh, I'm not going to tell you what it's used for. You guys find out yourself. Once again, it's just literally a blacktop highway going this way and coming this way. This still stands. This is now a modern freeway. I mean, modern, wide, concrete, fenced off freeway. But back then in the day, look at that. It is so cool. With stop signs and all that good stuff. The Santa Fe um, Pullman Standard 3-bay grain car back there. Or hopper car. Covered hopper car. If Zara is watching, this is the Santa Fe. This is a little uh, terminus yard at, at um, Blythe, California. Blythe, California. This is how I used to look at look like once in a day it was on the border of Arizona and California along the Colorado River and this photograph is interesting in the background you could see we have a sandstorm building that's very common out towards Arizona way especially during the monsoon season which is July and August and every day you get hit with a monsoon in the afternoon pretty much and unless you've been in one it's actually a lot of fun because it's something we don't see out here anymore or ever. And um, these buildings, I, I think, last time I drove through here and we went out here to do some rail fanning, these buildings were still there. Uh, these boxcars, what they use them for is to, is to uh, ship alfalfa in. And they have to be covered because when it rains or any type of moisture will ruin the load. So they ship them in big giant rolls, kind of like, steel coils inside boxcars and when we were there it's because a whole string of locomotives of g30s had uh derailed right here and we're on the ground and we went out there and took a bunch of pictures and stuff and i've got pictures galore that we will be here for weeks let's just kind of start to end it right about here here's some more cool santa fe structures that were along the santa fe at one time Here's another one. Here's one up towards Edwards and Mojave at Boron. Yes, folks, that's where we used to get our soap and some Boron products from the city of Boron, California. And they're famous for their Boron, like 20 mule trains. This, I believe, is up in, um, not Fresno, this is Bakersfield Santa Fe Depot. It's the freight depot. Here's another shot of the Fresno Santa Fe Depot taken from a different angle. I've been there also. You can see the grain elevators in the background. 
Burlington Northern unit working the yard. Here's a picture. This is all gone. This is where Santa Fe would pour into the heart of San Francisco at a place called China China Bay or China Lake. That's what the center. And I think the only way to get in there was by ferry, if I recall correctly. Or take the long route around the bay and come in down from Richmond. But that's what it used to be. All this is prime real estate. This picture was taken years ago. And trust me, all this has been, um, has been, a. Uh, it's either housing or brand new construction or uh, this is just primo, primo expensive land up there in China, China Basin. China Basin, San Francisco. Thank you from the collection of Phil Serpico. 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 But thank you um, to Phil or Phil's family. I, I guess I managed to acquire a couple of your photographs that were for sale at the swap meet. And um, I'm honored to have your work in my workshop in Anaheim, California. So let's end the film, our videotape right about here with this. Some of you may recognize what these are, some may not. These are date nails. Uh, I don't know if all railroads did that, but out here on the Santa Fe, because I don't think Southern Pacific did this. Out here on the Santa Fe, they worked on a section of track. This is during the steam days now, uh, or early 50s and 60s. They worked on a section of track tie work was involved they had to put a date nail on there with those numbers signify the year because wooden ties had to be inspected and replaced every eight to ten years if i recall correctly and how they kept track of that pre computers and instead of filling out paperwork and stapling it to the side of the railroad ties which would dissolve on the first rainstorm they had to have something hard metal and mechanical to fix to the ties so they came up with date nails this is what they use on the santa fe and what that 25 represents right there guys that's 1925 the year 1925 i actually plucked this off some ties many of these came from fullerton where i showed you the photographs in part one and two some came from the P Pvi line in Arizona, the Santa Fe line that ran down, I think, into Parker. It's called the Pvine line on the Santa Fe, came off the main line. And uh, some of these I bought at the swap meet. This one I bought at the swap meet because it's the year 1967. That's the year I was born. But these are designed to go into railroad ties. So the track inspector comes by and he sees what time, what year those ties were replaced last and they can go about uh, planning their maintenance or whatever they have to do. But uh, let you guys know how serious I was about this hobby. Yeah. So, um. <clears throat> Nineteen thirty-seven, nineteen forty-three, another nineteen sixty-seven, nineteen fifty-two, nineteen thirty-two. This one's actually bent. Nineteen twenty-eight. Think nineteen twenty-eight, New York Yankees. 1943-1954. Thank you for joining me. You guys have been awesome. Have fun. I hope you guys enjoyed my very simple, yet humble, yet prized to me collection. Like I said, um, if you guys are going to go down this path, 1948, this hobby, uh, you guys, I'm envious. You guys are going to have a blast. 1924. This is all stuff I 
swept off the railroad throughout the years. 1951. What year were you born? 1932. I'm sure I got one just for you. 1941. We all know what happened in 1941. 1929. So, um, they don't use these anymore. Obviously, they stopped using these, I think, in the late 60s. So, um, if you still find them out there, you know, you find yourself something that's uh, been long gone from the railroad and um, you hopefully can add it and cherish it in your collection. So you guys take care. You've been awesome. I will talk to you guys later. Have a great weekend. Bye.